Fora TV. The world is thinking. Welcome everybody to uh, What is China Thinking? Uh, and thanks first of all to the sponsors who are the Institute of Ideas Emerging Economies Forum and to our producer, Claire Fox, who uh, uh, produced the session. My name's Sheila Lewis. Uh, in my day job, I run a consulting company. And in my spare time, which is unfortunately not enough, um, I've been researching and occasionally writing and uh, lecturing on different aspects of China's modernization for about the last 25 years. But I, I uh, emphasize the word occasionally. Um, next month is the 30th anniversary of China's official opening up and reform process. And at that point, China will be reflecting and assessing and uh, celebrating its achievements uh, since 1978. What we've been discussing in other sessions that have touched on, on what's happening in China is that in, the, in those last 30 years, the scale of uh, industrialization, urbanization that we've seen in China in those 30 years has never been seen before. Uh, it's been absolutely phenomenal. And this, of course, has generated a huge amount of discussion and debate across the world. Uh, lots of interest in what's going on there. The unfortunate thing, though, is that a lot of that discussion and debate has been seen through a prism of preoccupations and prejudices of people from where they come from. So, so in the UK and America, there seem to be people worrying about themselves and uh, uh, transposing that onto China rather than actually looking at what's going on inside China. More attention seems to be placed on the unpleasant side effects of uh, development than, than, is, than is spent on examining, as I say, examining what is going on and what people in China really think and believe about themselves, about their role in the world and their future. So today, we've got an opportunity with four uh, excellently qualified speakers to have a much more balanced discussion about what's going on inside China. What do Chinese people think and uh, what's really going on there? So to introduce the speakers, and I will keep them to eight minutes and no more, that's it. Um, on my extreme right is Alan Hudson, who's Director of Leadership Programs for China for the uh, Department for Continuing Ed Education at Oxford University. He's visited China many times and has regular discussions with leading civil servants and entrepreneurs uh, in China. Alan's also researched, written and lectured on a wide range of social and public policy, both in the UK and in China. On my right is, is Duncan Hewitt, who actually lives in Shanghai and was formerly BBC correspondent in China and now writes for Newsweek. His involvement with China spans uh, from his time there as a student studying Chinese in the late 1980s. Last year, his book, uh, Getting Rich First, Life in a Ch Changing China, was published. And it's a very readable book, and I would commend it to everybody. It details China's transformation and its impact on people in China. Bing Chin Li, who's on my extreme left, is a lecturer in social policy at the LSE and has a particular interest in urban social exclusion and rural to urban migrants. Bing Chin has written widely on urbanization and social policy in China and has collaborated with uh, ac other academics uh, with researchers across Asia and in the US. Adrian Hornsby on my left is a man of very diverse interests and activities, from writing about China to researching enterprise-driven enterprise developments to writing plays, uh, as well as being head of research and analysis for an ethical investments uh, specialist. He's also director of, a, of a, an organization called Kilometer Zero, which is an international arts and politics collective. Of particular relevance to today's discussion, though, uh, he's a principal author and editor of a vast volume called The Chinese Dream, uh, which looks in depth at the forces shaping China's urbanization. So first of all, I'd like you to start, Alan. Okay. Um, 
Can I stand up because I can stretch my lungs a bit? I don't. Hopefully, that's not in, you know going to force you to do the same. Um, Sheila made the point that this is next month is the 30th anniversary of the opening up process, and um, one way of looking at that is that it's 30 years of uh, unparalleled success uh, for modern China. But if you talk to many uh, people in China, and certainly in the political leadership and in the vicinity of the political leadership, their point to you about the future of China uh, is that they're entirely unsure whether this is sustainable, not in the uh, modern use of the ecological sense of that word, I hasten to add, but uh, they would point to the fact that it might be a blip in the last 120 or even 200 years of China's modern history, which, uh, in which China has suffered incredibly badly. Uh, first from foreign intervention and then from internal political struggle. So that one important aspect of the way that Chinese people approach the next few years is a, far lack, a greater lack of certainty about the future than we often presuppose about Chinese society uh, from the outside. I'm hoping to try and do my short contribution around one particular theme and probably by the nature of that I should be one-sided. But what I, want you, what I want to do is to discuss the idea of democracy. Uh, and I don't want to merely do that in relationship to contemporary China. But I want you, and I hope this isn't presum presumptuous, to think about how we would theorise or think about democracy at three different times, uh, leaving aside classical democracy. One is, what do we understand by democracy when Britain was rising to be the world hegemon? What did we understand about the nature of democracy when the United States was rising to be the world hegemon? And what we might understand about the nature of democracy now when China might well become the leading power in the world so that we can think about whether or not uh, democracy is uh, entirely socially conditioned, culturally conditioned, or has a universal quality which is mediated through specific times and institutions, which is uh, my view of, uh, of the subject. So that's what I'm going to try and do. And I want to start, and uh, a little bit anecdotally, two or three years ago I, 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 I shared several bottles of red wine with somebody who's um, a, a minister, a junior minister, but a minister in the Chinese government, uh, and we had a, quite a, a long discussion, uh, mediated through a third person, a, a translator, a, a colleague, but a translator, in which we discussed the nature uh, uh, of democracy. And afterwards, um, it occurred to me that the discussion was not so much culturally based, which is what was one of the arguments, but it was a very different conception of democracy, in which I was the old-fashioned one, assuming that it meant government of the people, by the people, for the people, and his conception of democracy owed much more to contemporary Western understandings, which perhaps bear more relationship to uh, New Labour uh, and uh, Facebook conceptions a la Obama. And he was up to date, and I was very old-fashioned on, on the question of what dem democracy really is. So, what's going on in China, I think, in relationship to this subject, is an attempt to revisit, in peculiar circumstances, the classical issue of, of democracy, I think since the watershed, which I would locate sometime in the 1850s, 1860s, I refer again to, for example, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is the relationship between the masses and the elite, and how the masses, or how the elite negotiate and renegotiate their relationship with the masses, the population, in order to get some form of political legitimacy, of which democracy seems to have become, at least in the Western imagination, the most pertinent or least painful version. And, but at the moment, that relationship between the masses and the elite, not only in China, but in the West, is either attenuated or non-existent. And China has arrived at that point precisely at the, uh, at the possibility of a change, precisely at the point when democracy is actually little understood anywhere else in the world. And so if they were looking for an example in the West, they wouldn't actually find it, except in historical documents. At the same time, what's happening in China, as I think, is every single debate about the nature of democracy is being reproduced. Let me give you just uh, two examples in relationship to that. So, for example, many of you will have heard about the rehabilitation of Confucius as a way of understanding Chinese society and transposing it to contemporary terms. What you might not have heard of, uh, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, is that alongside Confucius, there has been a great interest inside Chinese intellectual academic circles uh, uh, with Leo Strauss and Carl Schmitt, who basically were uh, the protagonists about the export of, uh, of, uh, of neoconservatism around the world. Uh, if you go back to Alan Bloom, The Closing the American Mind, and their intellectual heritage is Plato. So you have Plato and Confucius as elements which are 
vying for our understanding about the way that China's society should develop. The common element, of course, is that the idea is that the elite, a self-sustained elite, a, a, perhaps a, a, a permeable elite, but certainly different, knows best. And they can then translate what's necessary in society through a process. I, it's an alien uh, tradition to, uh, uh, to a contemporary uh, modern political tradition, which does have its place in China. I mean, I don't want to rehearse this too much, but China has just as much of a 20th century history in the battle for democracy as any other country in the world. The second discussion, which I think has been uh, translated into uh, uh, the Western imagination about China as much as in China, is one which I think was very usefully um, summarised uh, in a recent book by Paul Ginsberg, uh, we, where he imagines a conversation between Karl Marx and John Stuart Mill about the nature of democracy, between participatory democracy and representative democracy. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then you, you read this, and it's a very good critique of the limits of democracy in the West, and then it arrives uh, with, this, uh, with a discussion of how it can be reinvigorated, and it's called combined democracy. And the element of combined democracy is to relocate democratic institutions at the level of the global state, or global institutions, with, and I'll come on to this a bit later if I have the time, with new institutions of global civil society, for example, NGOs, which would replace democratic mechanisms at the level of the state. And this also is equally interesting uh, to the, the Chinese leadership, to reposition itself inside the context of the global uh, uh, community. What I would say at this point, I think, is to try and grapple with something which is often referred to in the West as a limit, uh, limiting factor inside uh, China, is the absence of so-called civil society, which in some sense is a nonsense because civil society is generated spontaneously in many different forms. But what's usually meant is in two senses. One is the 18th century conception of civil society derived from the uh, tradition of Adam Smith as opposed to Rousseau, which is that which is given by the market as opposed to the state. And that, of course, will develop spontaneously in China uh, through institutions of the market. The second one, which is a much more modern understanding of civil society, is, in, is in pluralist institutions, which mean that we define ourselves not merely as one thing, but as uh, the leader of the Boy Scouts Association, uh, husbands, fathers, supporters of West Ham United, etc., etc., that we are pluralist in our outlook. And points to the absence of such institutions in, in China. But referring back to my original point, I, I don't think they, they don't exist in China. I think there are certain limits, for example, to the uh, development of, N, uh, of NGOs. But what I would point to is their absence inside Britain and America and Europe, which is intriguing to Chinese policymakers, because referring to my day job, when they come here to Britain, among other things, what they're interested in is developing forms of consultation or governance or process which are actually very fashionable in the West, which they think they can then export into China, which would solve the problem, given the nature of the political elite, of actually having to deal with the huge problem of the potentiality of the masses, both in terms of its creativity and, for them, its destructivity. And I think uh, that's a, an important point to, to recognise. So there's two elements which are being reinterpreted and developed in terms of political theory. But they do take on a particular Chinese aspect uh, because they're, pri they're primarily about the fact that China is a much more dynamic society and therefore these problems will become more pointed uh, and pertinent. And let me just conclude with this point, and it's basically throwing out because for you to think about how you understand democracy and what you would expect, how you would expect it to develop in any society, uh, and China in particular, is you can either understand the need for democracy in a very instrumental way, which, for example, in Will Hutton's argument about the limits of the Chinese boom is that you have to have democracy, otherwise capitalism can't function because it won't be innovative, which is historically illiterate if you look at Bismarck's Germany and Meiji Restoration Japan, but, you know, has a certain coherence to it. Or you can look at democracy as the, the delivery of, of, of social distribution and social goods. How do you get social stability by delivering and redistributing up to a point uh, the public, uh, public measures, and this is basically uh, what's behind Xiao Kang, the development of economic development and social justice, making sure there's enough to keep people on board. Or you can look at democracy as a good in and of itself, in a, perhaps in an Aristotelian or Machiavellian sense, as a virtue, which is the pursuit of happiness, in, or in the Jeffersonian sense. And I don't mean pursuit of happiness in the contemporary British sense of Richard Layard of getting councillors to make sure that you're happy, 
I mean, it in, I mean it in a much more traditional sense of having an argument to make you happy, uh, which is, I understand, uh, as the nature of democracy. So which of those is applicable? Where will China go? I don't know. I actually think that uh, the, ch the Chinese society is going to enter into a period in which even the, poli well, the political leadership will be able to hold on, but, for, but in a very, very tentative way. Largely, and if I can make this point very, very briefly, because the nature of the, nature of the individual and the citizen in China and I say this entirely hopefully without any sense of, uh, of being patronising or, or, or virulent, is that the nature of politics in the Western East is to characterise the most citizens a bit like Marx characterised the peasantry in 1850. It's at the moment we're just a sack of potatoes in which each potato can't speak to the other one. And China is a bit like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, thank you. Well... My, my focus has tended to be on um, not so much on, on issues of ideology but on, on the way that everybody in China has been through an extraordinary transformation in their own lives over the past couple of decades um, and uh, to look at how people have adapted with that and to that and, and what it's left them feeling. Um, and, you know, just to give you an example, when, when I first studied in China uh, in the 1980s and, and we're talking about just over 20 years ago. Um, the first time I went to be Beijing uh, to Tiananmen Square uh, was on National Day 1986, and uh, the whole square was sort of bedecked with various kind of celebratory flower arrangements and uh, big paintings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, uh, and of course, Chairman Mao and Sun Yat-sen. Um, these days, certainly in places like Shanghai, where I live, things on the surface can feel rather different. Uh, a friend of mine opened an art gallery in, in uh, China not long ago in a big city, and uh, the local leaders uh, were invited to the opening ceremony, so uh, they sent somebody around to check out the venue in advance, and uh, this friend had acquired a couple of uh, sort of cast-off oil paintings of Marx and Engels from some local government unit that didn't think it needed them anymore. Um, and when, the, when this man from the city government came to check out the venue, he looked at these paintings on the wall and he said, oh dear, dear, you know, sorry. you're going to have to take those off. Um, this wouldn't be suitable for our leaders to be seen in front of these. Um, when I was in China in, in 86, 87, we were right in the middle of a political movement called the Campaign Against Bourgeois Liberalization, um, which was basically the f one of the first waves of reaction to the in influx of Western ideas uh, and, and Western materialism uh, in the 1980s. Um, so, you know, various people were sacked, including Hu Yaobang, and various people kicked out of newspapers and the party. Um, now, you know, 15 years later, already for quite a few years, you can pick up a Chinese lifestyle magazine and it will give you tips on how to be petty bourgeois, which is now a kind of sophisticated lifestyle choice, and I, I fear that many people in Shanghai have chosen it. Um, so you're, we're really talking about a society which on, on one level has had its values turned completely upside down. Um, and a lot of that goes back to the, the, the ideas of economic reform, which I've kind of used in the title of my book as a shorthand. Deng Xiaoping said, uh, we, we must let some people and some regions of the country get rich first uh, in order to gradually bring along everyone else and then achieve this common prosperity, which, which Alan just mentioned. Um, I think that possibly during the 1990s in particular, the, the second half of, of that uh, maxim was rather forgotten. Um, and so we saw an increasingly uh, divided society as the 1990s economic reform post Tiananmen and post Deng Xiaoping's southern tour in 92 really kicked in and the government began to seriously streamline the state-run economy in order to save money, to reduce the welfare burden on enterprises. Um, so people who had had their whole life kind of paid for by the state uh, suddenly found themselves going through this rather sort of Thatcherite experience where housing was effectively marketized, where you started having to pay for education, where even things like healthcare you began to contribute more to. And certainly in the countryside, the, the rural uh, kind of cooperative health system collapsed. Um, and 
you know, some people did very well out of this, and some people were, were very happy about this. Um, I, I remember picking up a, a Guangzhou newspaper a few years ago, and there was an advertisement on the front page for one of these many luxury real estate developments, which now kind of pockmark the, the former Chinese countryside. Uh, and the slogan for this very exclusive uh, suburban development simply said, let some of the people get rich first. So, you know, they were using what Deng said as, a, as an excuse to, to promote something that was completely elitist. And, you know, the advertising for real estate in China is among the most elitist you'd see anywhere in the world. It's all about princes and kings and monarchs and divine right, you know, to be better off than other people. So there's a bit of that going on. Um, so, in, and, and in, in many ways, that economic reform period from the 90s onwards... Uh, led to a huge social change, which may not have been intentional, but was a kind of spin-off as the state retreated from, from many areas of life uh, in terms of controlling people's lives through the work unit. Uh, you know, suddenly people were forced to buy their own homes outside their work unit, to live separately from all the people they'd worked with, which was quite a new thing in the cities. Um, and it, it meant that China you know, people began to have much more space in their in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so you could say that, I, to me, during, during the past 20 years or so, China has gone through many of the social changes that Western societies went through in the 40 years after World War II, um, compressed and accelerated at, at, an, at an enormous rate. So you've had a sort of consumer revolution, a sexual revolution. You've had the rise of the teenager and youth culture as something distinct. Um, you've had this amazing urbanization that Sheila talked to. Um, and it means that the young generation in particular are growing up in an extremely different era. Uh, and, you know, think about teenagers now, 18-year-olds. They, they weren't even born in 1989, you know. So they, they've grown up in a very, very different world. Um, and I think that it's generally agreed that there's a much greater sense of sort of independence among the young generation uh, there have been some surveys which have shown that in the average Chinese urban nuclear family, uh, in any conversation, 48% of the time is dominated by the one child, 20% um, by each parent, and sort of 5% by the grandparents if they're lucky. Uh, and I think a lot of older people do feel quite left behind by the way that society has been turned on its head, particularly we've had this physical urbanization, modernization where old neighborhoods have suddenly been replaced by high rises. Young people are much more at home, perhaps, in these kind of, you know, the shopping centers of Shanghai. But a lot of old people who wouldn't, you know, who see their grandchildren getting their first job after school or university and earning, you know, five times or 10 times more than the older generation ever, ever earned in their lives and really feel that they're on the scrap heap, particularly because a lot of them lost their education in the Cultural Revolution. So you've got all kinds of generation gaps. Um, I think some older people feel fairly bitter, and particularly those who've watched state enterprises privatized and you know the bosses doing quite well out of it. Um, so in some senses, I feel that you can say China really has gone through some of the same sort of ideological disillusionment that uh, the Eastern Bloc countries went through after 1989. Um, but you know, at the same time as they've gone through this, everybody has been constantly told that they are still communists and that it is still a socialist country. Um, so the government, I think, realized a few years ago that there's a real ideological gap um, and people were rushing into religion and to various strange cults and, you know, all kinds of different belief systems that sprang up or reappeared in the 90s. Um, in the past few years, I think we've seen the government make a very concerted effort to keep up with what young people think uh, and I had a rather strange experience last year where I went to this animation festival in Hangzhou, which is not far from Shanghai. Um, and it was basically all about that kind of Japanese anime cartoon style um, of youth culture. Uh, and there was a lot of money to be made because there was a trade fair too and they're doing a lot of animation. Um, but you had government leaders sitting on a grandstand while there was a big parade of people dressed up as sort of grapes and various, you know, underwater cartoon characters as sci-fi warriors in gold body armor with blue wigs and silver-plated submachine guns. Um, and, you know, and then the man from the state administration of radio, film, and TV got up and said, ah, this is a very useful contribution to socialist spiritual civilization. Um, but when you went into the exhibition, you could see what he meant because there were computer games and trendy modern animation, 
based on things like the Long March or young Chinese soldiers fighting the Japanese in the 1930s. So they were using it to push a kind of patriotic message and to keep up with a young generation which has much more diverse interests. And I think the government is you know, becoming quite clever in this respect. Uh, they've also realized the great social divides that we were just hearing about have caused a lot of anger. And um, that's why there's this spending on, as Alan said, the Xiao Kang and creating the new socialist countryside. Finally, after 15, 20 years, money is going back into rural welfare, which had just vanished. Um, and of course, the other big thrust of what the government does in terms of what young people think is patriotic education. And we saw this year, um, with a lot of anger directed towards the West in China following the events in Tibet and the protests at the torch relay for the Olympics in, in the West, uh, we saw that a lot of young people have definitely absorbed at least part of this patriotic education. Um, but just to wrap up, I think that it's still a much more complex picture than it ever was before. Um, on the one hand, you have people on the internet denouncing sort of Western hegemony. On the other hand, you have people kind of trying to sue the government if it blocks websites that they want to read. And young people are very committed to the internet, I think. Um, the government is getting clever about things like religion. It's realized that there's a social role for religion to play in terms of social welfare. So they're willing to accept more diversity of thought. Um, but this question of civil society, I think, is very important, and we've seen people with houses, you know, really fulfilling that sort of political science theory that if you have property, you want to defend it. And they are demanding a more transparent government in some, some of the bigger cities. Certainly, you see these protests when the Shanghai government tries to build the magnetic railway line past people's houses. You know, they will go and march around outside the city government, not in a very confrontational way. And it seemed to work quite well this year. The government thought again, uh, temporarily. Um, and we see in the media, too, young journalists on the one hand supporting the government line on these big international issues. But when the earthquake happened in, in uh, Sichuan, um, the, the Propaganda Bureau, uh, or whatever it's called now, the Publicity Bureau, issued a, a directive saying that local media from different parts of China shouldn't send journalists there. They should get all their news from S Xinhua News Agency and CCTV, China Central Television. Um, but everybody ignored them. They all just went. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of different forces going on, some patriotic, but some where people are much more focused on their own interests. And I think it's a big battleground, and I think the government knows that. Whether they can, can deal with it in the long term, I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ding <laughs> Chin. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, when I first, re uh, after I received Claire's uh, invitation, I actually uh, went back to China twice and uh, I asked people the question because I had this uh, event in my mind. So uh, the first question is, what is China thinking about? And uh, whoever you ask, they find it very difficult to answer this question. But then I asked, what are you thinking about? <laughs> Uh, especially after the Olympic Games. And people, you get a whole variety of uh, very interesting answers. And um, after the Olympics, and the first thing people were, think, uh, were really uh, concerned is uh, probably everybody have heard about it, is the poisonous uh, milk powder uh, and the milk. And uh, people joke about a lot about it at the dinner table and all these uh, and uh, basically, they have lost trust of uh, what is going on in the food industry locally as well. And um, another event is about the launching of the rockets into the space. And uh, interestingly, when you travel in the West, and people were very keen to watch, follow the television, and we were supposed to have a meeting on uh, the day when, uh, when the a rocket was uh, launched and it was cancelled and uh, everybody went back home to watch this uh, event on TV. But then uh, the next day when I went to Beijing and I asked people whether you have watched it and very few people have watched it. Partly because uh, the spaceship was launched in the western provinces and the people felt very proud of it but uh, in the east is not apart from the media and uh, to the ordinary people it's not that a big deal. And the second, uh, the third uh, issue is um, 
about the Olympic, after the Olympic, you thought that uh, people at the local level might be uh, enthusiastic because there were uh, fireworks going on. And uh, actually, uh, the fireworks, uh, some of the fireworks actually put off, uh, um, um, put on by the migrant workers who run, who were driven out of Beijing during this um, uh, event. And you just wonder why they were the sort of victims in this uh, event, but why, why they actually uh, celebrate during the opening ceremony is very mind puzzling to me as well. And um, but uh, people, uh, but uh, when you ask people in the local uh, government, and they sort of are saying that uh, uh, they don't think it has much to do with uh, the Olympic has much to do with their local uh, situation. It wasn't as important as the Asian game, which happened several years ago, because the Asian during the Asian game, the local authorities were required to to contribute to the funding of Olympics. But this time it wasn't, uh, they were not uh, really, uh, especially in the West, so uh, they basically it had nothing to do with them. And uh, another point is about, uh, this time I just went back several days ago, it's uh, all about uh, economic recession and uh, the problem of the stock market and the, the price plunge in the stock market. And then another important effect is the land reform who benefit and who will benefit and who will lose as a result of it. The land basically where um, uh, people can uh, become leaseholders and transfer the lease to other people in rural areas. And this is considered to be a main reform. And uh, whether people in the city will all run to the countryside to, um, to buy off the land and the farmers will become uh, uh, we lose their land and we become poor, and this is a big debate. And then this particular, these several things, and uh, lead to um, my key point uh, is, um, you know, when people talk about intellectuals in these cities, uh, in in the Chinese uh, context, and they often consider that um, intellectuals historically were a group of people who use their moral power, not necessarily knowledge, to guard the poor people or the ordinary people against the ruling class. And even the emperors would show respect to these intellectuals. But these days, people increasingly find that it is difficult. Intellectuals were trying to guard the interest of the middle class or trying to guard some other people who are not me. And um, if you read some uh, books written by uh, Chinese scholars trying to compare the idea of intellectuals in China and in the West, and they found that uh, there are no intellect proper intellectuals in China anymore. And uh, then to me, and I personally think this might be a reflection of um, the situation that the Chinese society is getting so diversified and it's very difficult for one intellectual or academic person or scholars to represent the whole population. So you end up always being whoever you represent or your theory represent, end up being criticized by somebody else. So. Um, then that also uh, corresponds to the sort of uh, idea actually uh, put by Mao during the Cultural Revolution time is uh, scholars are, um, have to uh, be, you know, the hair on the skin and uh, you have to uh, belong to somebody. And uh, ordinary people still think this is very uh, important, but the reality is you, you simply cannot represent any, uh, everybody these days. And um, another point I want to make is um, even for each simple reforms, including, for example, uh, the land reform I just mentioned, the policy was sup originally supposed to be um, uh, dealing with uh, farmers who, uh, uh, who lost their land during the uh, urban expansion. And uh, a lot of people were saying that you need to protect the property right, 
of individuals so that they can protect themselves properly. But then uh, when this is proposed, was pro uh, proposed, a lot of people, uh, some other people uh, from the left actually argued that uh, uh, these farmers do not have enough power. So if you privatize the land and other people, uh, urban people with money will come and uh, force them to give up their land. And um, simply because uh, they do not have enough financial power. As a result, the policy, if you read the real text, which is many, many pages, it become, uh, so the tone is so much softened and uh, there's, no, there's nothing about privatization anymore. There's nothing about the rights, uh, the, the property rights anymore. It's more about um, allowing people to transfer. The pro it's very, very, uh, in a very um, indirect way. So you see, even with this reform, on the two sides, the left and the right, are fighting each other very in a very uh, severe way and uh, more and more um, the idea from the left is getting stronger so um, also uh, probably you are aware of uh, Wen Jiabao published an article uh, in the newspaper saying that uh, there needs to be democracy in uh, that he's, uh, he published an article and uh, then from the left school, the party school writers and uh, wrote against it and published in another uh, newspaper, also a party-owned newspaper, strongly criticized about it. Just imagine, this is the premier of the Chinese uh, government. And uh, the last point I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about is the cynicism about politics in the Chinese uh, audience. I agree with uh, what Duncan uh, just said. Um, a lot of times, um, if, you ask, if you talk to people and they tell you the official line, but that doesn't mean that they really agree with it. So when they recite the official lines is often used in a way to serve their own interests. This refers to all different social class in the country. Uh, I give you one example to finish. Is, um, if you talk to Chinese people when there is something wrong, they always say that um, there is something wrong with the system or the institution. That's why things do not work. When you ask them, what do you mean by institution or system? They had back in their minds actually talking about democracy. So, but when you ask, are you part of it? Because central government officials are using the same excuse, local officials using the same excuse, individuals use the same excuse. But are you part of them? Are you trying to do things to improve the system yourself? And the people just, uh, it just didn't happen to them. And uh, so um, the kind of uh, cynicism I found, um, probably you need to uh, get around it after several uh, drinks. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Adrian. Okay, so um, I also was thinking about this title that we've been given, What is China Thinking? And um, it struck me last night that it's actually bi-semantic, because you could say it either inquisitively, you know, what is China thinking? But um, equally, there's, a, there's another way of saying it, which would be, you know, what is China thinking? Which has actually, I think, characterized most of, uh, or, you know, a great deal of commentary from the West on China over the, over the years, certainly 2004 to 2007 when there's been this combination of uh, worry and distrust around the uh, inscrutability of the Chinese government and the processes and what they've actually been doing. And uh, I remember it was about a year ago um, exactly that I went to, I was in a conference in Chatham House with Will Hutton. And Will Hutton was speaking in an extremely alarmist fashion, very much, you know, what is China thinking? What the hell are they doing? What are they up to? Um, and he was saying, you know, they have to revalue the RMB seriously. And I'm talking, you know, 30%, 20% revaluation of the RMB. And I mean now, I mean within three months, otherwise the wheels are going to come off. It was a really extreme speech. I think the wheels are going to come off was exactly his phrase. And, um, you know, looking at how things have gone over the, over the year subsequently, 
then the truth is that you know, the wheels kind of have come off in a rather spectacular fashion. You know, we saw the Bear Stearns come off, and then Lehman came off, and Merrill's, and so on. But the thing which is striking, of course, is that all of these wheels are American wheels, not Chinese wheels. And there's been a degree of uh, substantial smugness among Chinese bankers who you know, were being criticized for, for a decade by Western analysts and saying, you know, you're doing this in completely the wrong way. And of course, it's America that's had the collapse. But um, the thing which is peculiar about the American collapse is, in a sense, it was absolutely... I mean, everybody's got 2020 hindsight, but it was, it was absolutely obvious that something was out of whack and that they had a decade of considerable overspending. Americans were just making less money than they were spending. They were spending more money than, they were, than was coming in. And according to the Macorber principle, that, you know, if you have an income of one and eight and you have outgoings of two shillings, then the result is misery. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what's happened. You know, the, the place has, has imploded. And, you know, when you look at the way that that was allowed to continue, then, you know, you, ask, you end up sort of saying, you know, what was America thinking? You know, what the hell were they up to? But um, the important aspect to remember is that this was actually facilitated by the fact that it was a decade of overspending which was allowed to happen because of the fact that there was this enormous influx of cheap credit from China. The Chinese, by um, suppressing the value of the RMB, were buying up American dollars for, for a decade. And they built up you know, $1.9 trillion. It's an astonishing sum. And uh, I read um, this week, actually, the Bank of England uh, released a report about you know, what they reckoned the actual size of the bailouts and the write downs are going to have to be in relation to this credit crisis and they came up with the figure of 2.8 trillion well you know the chinese sovereign wealth fund or the chinese foreign exchange reserves are 1.9 trillion and the gulf countries have got about 0.8 trillion and so you know there it is but also the fact that the american economy has imploded has severely damaged china as well on the basic level if you own 1.9 trillion dollars and the dollar starts to drop then you lose a lot of money very fast um, the other thing to recognize also is that China is still a phenomenally export-driven economy. Um, people talk about decoupling, but it, it doesn't actually follow through in any serious fashion. And um, what's happened in China over the last year is that growth has gone down from 12% to 9%. Um, and that's thought to be mostly on the back of weakening exports to America. And uh, the EU and Japan, as they enter a recession now, which is another major source of exports for China, is probably going to knock another couple of percentage points off the growth. You know, so we're looking at growth coming down to 7 or 8%. The thing which is um, striking about that is that uh, 7% is commonly given as a figure of the absolute minimum that the Chinese government has to continue to achieve to maintain social stability. And it's this process of riding the bull. I mean, you kind of think, you know, 7 to 8% growth sounds great. But, you know, there's, China has been this kind of phenomenal bull market. And the government, in order to keep control, has to keep riding the bull. It has to keep, the, you know, growth levels up at 7 or 8%. And so it's, you know, it does become a real question, you know, like what, what, what was China thinking when it started building up so much money? And, um, you know, the answer is that it was holding on to a pattern of growth which was very export-led. It was entirely to do with maintaining a low RMB and being able to export the cheap goods to Western countries. And this is kind of like a low-hanging fruit in terms of economic development, that you move the peasants in from the countryside into factories, you increase their productivity, and you pay them cheap wages and you ship out the Barbie dolls. And there's a need now is that kind of export ideal of how to run things is, is not going to work out anymore, that we, it has to become a more domestic-driven economy. You know, the consumer spending needs to go up. I mean, it is rising. It needs to be very important. It's been rising at 23% over the last year, the domestic spending, and so that's a significant boost for um, China's possibility to start concentrating more on its own economy. But also with that, then foreign brands are moving in in a very repetitive fashion, particularly um, you know, American and European brands which recognize that their own markets are not so bright. They're all trying to move into China. And so the Chinese home brands have got a particular problem at the moment to be able to compete. And uh, they need to be able to drive their own um, internal development in such a way that they will actually capture some of this new market which is being created. And so you look at the Chinese brands, and the thing which is, is extraordinary is that the top 30 companies in China are all state-owned enterprises, with the exception of a couple which are based in Hong Kong, and, you know, in that sense, are much less Chinese. And you see in China that actually the state involvement in almost everything above the cottage level. 
And this is damaging in particular when you look at the way in which Chinese businesses start and how they operate, is that you know, inevitably there's some kind of partnership with the local official, and the local official will have its own little local champion and will requisition land and will provide subsidized energy and will waive regulation to drive the economic growth within that area. And the result of this is just enormous abuses. They undercut standards, there's terrible pollution, and there's also appallingly poor products on the grounds that these local officials are you know, entering into these profitable partnerships with uh, local developers. And it's, not, and it's artificially cheap what they're actually doing. It's not competitive on a national level, but you, know, you have these local officials who are pushing the structure forward, and we see it in many things. I mean, you know, the San Lu milk is a classic example of how um, the, the products are, are not meeting the kind of standards they should, and it's not because of a, a, you know, too little regulation. It's because of too little implementation. The thing which is amazing about the Sanlu is that you know, when, it was actually, when they did a widespread test across baby milk powders in China, they found that 26 brands were actually contaminated with melamine. And so, you know, I mean, it wasn't just a question of one bad apple. The whole lot were, you know, fighting in this kind of rabble of internecine local companies trying to undercut each other in terms of standards and pricing and, and products and so forth. And we see this, you know, happening with a whole slew of bad Chinese products. There's the bad baby pajamas. There was the poisonous baby toys. And, you know, it's kind of enormously unfortunate when you have a one-child policy that you keep hitting up your babies so hard. And so... <laughs> Just to, to finish, you know, like how do you move beyond this notion of, of you know, how this society in which you're producing these poor products so much? And the answer is it's very hard for the state, for the central government with a country as large as China to be able to control in detail what's happening in each of the local provinces in a top-down fashion. And you know, really what's required is more accountability at the base level, you know, to have the information flowing upwards from an independent judiciary and a free press. And, you know, to have more information, you know, like if the, free, if the press had been allowed to report on Sanlu when it first became a problem, then um, it would have been stopped, you know, months before. So, you know, the Communist Party is facing this problem now, if, you know, to introduce more accountability, it has to have this paradox in that it has to start giving away power in order to be able to hold on to power. And I think this is what China is thinking about right now. How is it going to allow the, the power to be devolved? Thank you very much, Lee. Before I ask you for your comments and, and questions, there's just one, one question that I wanted to ask um, the panel. And, and that sort of arises from something that uh, Adrian's just hinted at in terms of um, the, the paradox of power, but really about the legitimacy generally. You, you talked about it, Bing Chin, in terms of um, the cynicism about politics. And generally, there appears to be a... a, a, a question of legitimacy of the, the Communist Party generally. And I'm not sure, in, Duncan, you spoke about the, the going and getting um, kids involved in sort of patriotic endeavours and that kind of thing. And, and, and Alan, you spoke about the rise of Confucianism. And I'd just, I'd just be interested in your views as to what is it that the uh, Communist Party can do to hold on to power, that power that it needs. I mean, obviously, Adrian, you might have a different take on this, but what, what is it? Is it Confucianism? Is it patriotism? How is the Communist Party going to maintain um, its legitimacy in the next period? Everybody, you well, go first? I mean, I, I think very simply it is partly um, patriotism and is partly, as, as uh, Adrian just suggested, economic growth and, and this point about, you know, riding the bull and, and keeping growth uh, at least 7% is very important because I think that, you know, one thing which explains why perhaps despite all of these upheavals China has been through in, in, in recent decades um, and despite the fact that there are lots of protests all over China, nevertheless, they have somehow managed to kind of hold it together so far. And obviously part of that is through a security apparatus. But, but part of it also, I think, gen genuinely, is that the, particularly that all these migrant workers who've you know, given up their home life, come to the cities and put up with terrible conditions and worked in all these factories, um, they have they have been prepared to put up with this in things which I think people in most Western societies wouldn't put up with because of a sense of aspiration. 
And that's what the government has really been selling to people. And that's what getting rich first or, you know, getting rich is glorious, all of these slogans, uh, I think, really meant to ordinary people. And then, you know, now if we really do see, we are seeing, I mean, thousands of factories, small factories especially, closing down all over China this year, and it could well get worse, as Adrian mentioned. So if we start then seeing lots of these migrant workers out, out of a job, um, then it does, it does raise all these difficult questions. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think patriotism and economic growth ha have generally replaced ideology. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think you can just reiterate the points about the attempt to cohere the parties around national uh, patriotism, which is not new, of course. Let's remember that the, um, the Chinese Communist Party's origin was as, as effectively as a nationalist party, um, and that its approximation to the, uh, the communist tradition is to appropriate cadre at organization rather than any politics. Uh, and that's w w at the level of individuals that you can actually see, I'd, on the one hand, a disintegration, but on the other hand, uh, a, a transformation. The disintegration is, if you join the party now, you're joining not one which went through the long march and not one went through the political struggles. You're basically making a career decision about where you're going to, where you're going to prosper. Uh, and you're doing that in relationship to the relative benefit of working in, in, in the extended public sector or in the private sector with the knowledge that there is a relationship between the public and the private in China which is peculiar. But at the same time, you are entering an organization which is qualitatively transformed in terms of its class composition and, it, and its outlook. And they actually perceive that as a, a source of stability. The transformation of the party and the personnel of the party is fundamentally different, which of course then exacerbates the cynicism of the people not in the party, either because they've been tried to get in and have been rejected or because they had no first interest in the first place. Just, uh, just one point in relationship to uh, what Adrian said, which I largely agreed with in terms of the, the necessity for economic dynamism. But there's one thing that I don't have the exact statistics that people should be aware of in relationship to what we normally associate as the state intervention in the economy, which is the level of taxation, is that the Chinese central government has an incredibly low tax base. And that's why most of the money is actually still generated within the productive sphere inside inefficient state enterprises. Because uh, going back to the question of democracy, there is no taxation without, it's not the question of no taxation without representation. Most of the people making money don't pay tax. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I agree with um, uh, Alan's point about uh, the Communist Party reinventing itself. And I think this is also a survival uh, strategy by the Communist Party. And uh, at the same time, I, apart, uh, on top of uh, what's uh, just discussed, and I think the reform of the so social security system mm. itself is very important because, um, you know, if you go to China and probably uh, you ask people and uh, you can feel that people are constantly uh, um, worrying about their children's education, health care, and this is the... F ultimate reason for them to keep, for people in the rural area to keep their land and do not abandon the rural life, and for the people in the city to save as much money as possible, just in case one day they will uh, suffer, and for the pensioners to save as much for their old age. So the whole idea of risk is very strong in the Chinese society. And um, there are about uh, 70,000 uh, protests uh, every year in the country. And um, around half is uh, about uh, farmers losing their land and uh, the government just, uh, or the real estate developers from the cities just take away their land. And, but at the same time, do not provide any uh, social uh, protection for them for the future. And this worry, constant worry about uh, what's going to happen in the future is really a main uh, uh, cause of resentment of the ordinary people. That's, thank you. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I think it's interesting. I mean, certainly the legitimacy of the Communist Party is economic growth, it's continued transformation, it's introducing better regulation. Um, in relation to land reform and the recent land bill that's gone through, I think that's you know, very much directed at this problem with the number of protests from the requisition of land and by corrupt local officials and to give those people more rights. Um, 
But it, one of the striking things about most of the protests is that they seem to be very much grievance-driven rather than keyed into a bigger idea of political change. And so, you know, like a group of farmers who've had their land taken away or it's been poisoned by a paper factory will, will organize and have a protest. But that is specific to one incident as opposed to, you know, the idea of a larger political change. And I think one thing which the Communist Party kind of has as a trump card in its back pocket is the fact that the last, you know, the last 100 years of, of Chinese history have seen, you know, phenomenal levels of political instability, you know, massive political change, continuous revolution as an idea, which was absolutely disastrous. It was, you know, it was incredibly horrible for all of the people who were living through it. And so the idea now that, you know, we have like a... To, most of the Chinese people that I met when I was there had very low opinion of the Communist Party but had absolutely zero interest in, in changing the political structure because they wanted to keep together with the thing that was actually delivering some of the economic growth that they so badly wanted. Thank you. And, and one point on that, I mean, a lot of people still have a very high opinion of Deng Xiaoping. I mean, they might not think too much of the party in general, but Deng as the man who started these 30 years of reform is sometimes surprisingly revered, I think, by a lot of people. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, out to you now. Um, we... Okay, right, over here, first of all. You, uh, in, in the last few words, Adrian, you sort of mentioned what happened in those 30 years. Sorry, you, he's got a new name, he used to be Mao. But anyway, what, is there a great conflict between that generation who for 30 years had their lives completely turned upside down? And they were driven by the little red book and an ideology. They were driven from one place to another. People were uh, brought out in public to be uh, exposed for being anti this, that, and the other. And suddenly, everything's changed. And I just wonder whether you actually got a complete conflict between a confused, frightened, and uncertain older generation and a younger one who are sort of thrusting themselves forward. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a frenzy of consumption, bearing in mind the people you've been talking about, the peasants and so on, who've been dispossessed, but you still have this old, older generation for whom this must be a quite extraordinary change. Thank you. Uh, lady back there. Um, I thought it was very interesting, the point about um, letting the people get rich first. And I wanted to ask, do you think this will create a... a a culture of um, elites that um, have no interest in um, reforming the society, um, particularly the, the last point that um, was just made by Adrian about um, a lot of the protests are grievance-driven um, rather than driven by political change. And also secondly, just quickly, I thought it was a very interesting um, point about how the, the family structure has changed and how the, the children are now um, having more of a say within the family rather than the grandparents. And do you think that's a reverse of the Confucian tradition of a very hierarchical society? Thank you. Um, chap in the middle. I wanted to ask about what you thought uh, the Chinese state will do with its currency reserves. <clears throat> um, most, uh, most emerging superpowers have uh, first emerged onto the world stage by using their economic power to influence the incumbent powers. So if you look at the rise of the US in the 1950s, they used their uh, economic might to force a foreign policy change uh, in the UK's approach towards Suez, for example. Um, I wonder whether the panel expects to see the Chinese state exercising a similar veto over US foreign policy at some stage in the future, considering, <clears throat> considering the impact that they could have on the, uh, the value of the dollar. Thank you. Um, right at the back, there's a... Um, I'm just um, thinking about what the core Chinese value might be. Um, but I'm just wondering whether I, the panel could comment on the issue of how controlled Chinese society is. And I'm just thinking of some historical examples. I think there's one book has, has um, used the wall as being the sort of core Chinese symbol, this desire to cut off from the world, to turn inwards in the way they did, I think, in the sort of 16th century when they laid up their fleets and basically turned their back on the world. Um, and the other thing I was interesting, I was just reading an intro to Confucius, and I'm amazed about how influenced he is by a thing called the Book of Rights, uh, rights in the sense of religious rights. 
And even in 500 BC, they had the most incredibly detailed rules and regulations about everything, every aspect of society. So Johnny's society seems to be very controlled, and I just wondered how the panel thinks that will play out in the future. Thank you. Just, just down here, right at the front, sorry, <laughs> making you run around. Um, I wanted to ask a question inspired by the second speaker um, about what the role of religion in China is now and what it will be in the future and, yeah, basically about the growth of religion in China. Thank you. Okay. I think <laughs> from those questions, you've got enough to get your teeth into. Um, who would, uh, Bing Ching, do you want to start? Yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to answer Whichever, every question. Any question. Whichever question you like. Don't, okay. don't try and answer them all. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in terms of elites, uh, the, whether they have an interest or not to, uh, uh, to reform, to change the society, and I actually do not worry so much about it. If you look at the history of Britain, the development of welfare state is actually uh, um, uh, out of the interest of the middle class people. And uh, at the same time in China, you already start to see this kind of sign. When you have so many poor people living around and uh, there can be so much externality the mm, poverty can cause to your own uh, life quality, I mean the middle class quality, life quality. And they really started to think, what can we do? And uh, also regarding uh, unemployment, and uh, of course, quite often, the poor people were just uh, put aside and the people do not pay very much attention to it. But in terms of uh, social uh, uh, instability um, or social unrest caused by uh, uh, a serious poverty, it, caused, uh, it in, um, attracted a lot of attention from the middle class people. So. Um, I think it's a matter of time, and the more uh, middle class people will pay more attention to how to um, improve the situation. Regarding the family changes, and um, I actually wouldn't consider the Confucius uh, tradition that children should pay more respect to the parents and should, should try to uh, pay for the parents' uh, old age is um, the only thing, and I think it is uh, he, what Confucius is uh, campaigning or what they were, cha were championing for was the um, uh, family value. So whichever way it goes, the support it goes, and uh, the relationship between the family and the society. And so personally, uh, I'm actually doing a research on this. I personally think it is going away from the idea that the state is, uh, sub, is uh, control, uh, controlling uh, individual households' life, livelihood, uh, but rather from uh, family members supporting each other more. And um, uh, whichever direction it, go, it, it is necessary to go to. So I think this is uh, returning to traditional value. Yeah, okay. probably, yeah. Um, so to pick up on the, the question about, you know, what it's like to be an older person in China, I mean, I think that's a fascinating, it's a fascinating question. I haven't, you know, and the truth is I don't, you know, I don't know, but most of the older people in China that I met, you know, they tend to keep pretty quiet about, you know, particularly people who went through the Cultural Revolution, it seems. And, you know, they're now getting on with things. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know quite what else do you do? I mean, if you've kind of been through a period in which you saw your village be torn up and everybody was randomly thrown in prison by little cadres and then, you know, cannibalism occurred. I mean, the whole thing was so wild and crazy. But, you know, like, what do you do other than continue with your life? I mean, on one level, then there's a there's an economic aspect of this, which is that I think it relates to high savings rates in China, particularly among older people who have, you know, got this back history of immense instability. And, you know, the desire to be able to save up a little bit of money and protect yourself in that fashion makes sense. Um, but, I mean, otherwise, you know, I mean, what's it like being a German in post-war Germany? I mean, you know, what did the Germans do? I mean, what is it, what's it like to be an ex-Nazi in the, in the 50s? You know, I guess what they did was they uh, managed to make their economy grow very effectively. Um, on, the, uh, on the question of the currency reserves, you know, what to do with $1.9 trillion, 
it's really, <laughs> it's really quite difficult to do anything much with $1.9 trillion. It's such an enormous sum of money that there's a, a major question of, you know, like, if you want to start ditching the dollar, for example, well, what the hell else are you going to buy? You know, there's not a lot in the world that you can buy for $1.9 trillion without completely upsetting a strange, you know, a market outside of either, you know, American or European stocks. So I think China, to some extent, is, is tied into having a continued um, relationship with the, with the U.S. and the EU and the Western world. And, and you, know, like, the, you know, they're so kind of bound together and the whole kind of like globalization um, process, which China has been extremely, um, it's, it's been very much at the forefront of, is, you know, does lead to greater political stability and there's, you know, there's less interest in, for China to start throwing its weight around in a, in a threatening fashion, I think. On, on this question of the, the older generation, I mean, I think that that's what Adrian says is absolutely right. And I, I think a lot of old people um, basically, had, they, they've just accepted that their sort of generation, their era is gone. Some of them feel bitter, but they, and a lot of them feel kind of left on the scrap heap, as I say. And lots of people were laid off at the age of 50 or, you know, in their late 40s from the state enterprises over the past decade. And in Shanghai, it's very visible. You know, a million people were laid off in Shanghai um, from, from the sort of early to mid 90s onwards. But a lot of these people are kind of just putting their hopes on the young generation. And, uh, you know, that's where some of that spending goes is on the education of the young. It puts a lot of pressure on the young. And I think the young are sort of half part of this family system and half wanting to be individuals and there are so many TV talent shows and reality shows in China. Um, everybody wants to be a star, you know, and I think that and some sociologists say it's a reaction to this kind of still quite pressurizing society. Um, and I think, you know, I talked to one sociologist in Shanghai who specializes in the young generation. He used to be a red guard. Um, and he says, you know, my, my son thinks I'm an idiot. You know, he says, how come people were pinning Chairman Mao badges to their flesh? You know, his son just wants to go and sort of listen to, to rock bands. Um, and, this, and this guy who's in his late 40s or probably early 50s now says, um, you know, China is now a youth society, going back to that point about Confucian family structure. Um, you know, he said we being the state and his friends who work for the government, we used to think we could tell the young generation what to do. Now we spend a lot of time listening to them. And I think that goes back to the government using the internet as a kind of channel for sort of discussion of uh, public policy and a, a kind of, you know, type of democracy. There was a case recently where the mayor of some town in Jiang Jiangxi or somewhere um, opened up this mobile phone hotline where you could call this mobile number if you were worried about your housing problems. And just thousands of people called about all kinds of problems. So that, that wasn't a great success. But, um, you know, some people, some older people have worked. Some, you know, I talked to one father who said, you know, he was in his 40s and he said, when I was a kid, if my father told me to do something, you know, we'd all, we'd all cower and do whatever he said. Now my son just laughs at me. But he said this, the, the way to deal with this is to be my son's friend. So some, you know, people in, older people in China or middle-aged people in China have been amazingly adaptable. I mean, that is something you can't forget if you look at how China has moved on. Some of them can do it. The education system is changing a bit too. But this guy, this sociologist I, I interviewed, um, he did admit that he and his friends in the kind of Shanghai circles of power do tend to sit around sometimes on long evenings sort of discussing the young generation and, and wondering, do, do we dare to ho sort of hand China's future over to these, you know, these people who are obsessed with Korean soap operas and Japanese <laughs> pop music and, you know, weird cartoon animation and so on. Thank you. Just, uh, um, I mean, I, no further comments on the thick description of individual tragedy, but um, I think it's worth making the point that in real terms there's been no settling of accounts, not only with the Cultural Revolution, but the whole of... Uh, uh, post-1949 Chinese history, and, uh, and that's not so much just access to the data and the, and the archives, it's uh, an absence of historical thinking, uh, which is not, mere, is not exclusively a Chinese phenomenon. On, on, just to, to add something on, on the demography question, the ageing question, which hasn't been touched on, which was a real and objective problem for the future, is that one of the consequences of the one-child policy, which I don't want to debate at the moment, is that at the moment China's in a demographic sweet spot, <laughs> 
and in another 20 or 30 years, the proportion of the population who is productive vis-à-vis -vis the number of people who are old will, will create a, new, a very different uh, economic and socio-political environment. And just even more briefly than that is that, and this is a very crude thought experiment, so that we just think more, think more globally. Uh, think of a 17-year-old in Shanghai uh, who's got a Facebook contact in Seattle and a cousin in Yunnan and who they've got the most com in common with. Um, on the question of, uh, I agree entirely with uh, uh, Lynn's point about the, uh, the, the nature of the middle class and the welfare state, which is precisely what's happening in China, but it's still more directed by the state, because that's the fundamental problem, is the fact that the neoliberal policies, which were supposed to trickle down wealth, didn't sufficiently quickly, and therefore the state has had to have a huge increase in its uh, social spending uh, in order to overcome the huge discrepancy, particularly between the coastal provinces uh, uh, and the West. And again, if you just think about the way these things are measured, is that the, there's a great celebration about the cash economy in China, uh, but if you, and you know, 400 mil million people coming out of poverty, but poverty is measured by the sum of one dollar a day to spend. If you're living in a subsistence economy, a, a dollar is a lot. If you're living in a cash economy, a dollar is absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and my final point, I'll come back to the others later, is this, it's on this Confucian question, and I want to just introduce this maybe slightly more provocatively, is that one of the great neo-Confucians from the West, Daniel Bell, no relation, makes the fundamentally reactionary point in a de debate with Michael Walser in dissent, is that one reason for not having introducing democracy in China is because the people in China will want to consume more resources and exacerbate global warming. Uh, and, you know, that in the sense of, you know, we don't have to... You know, the origin of the nature of reaction isn't in China, it's in, the, it's in Western thought on this question. Sorry, Bing Ting, you want to make one little point? Yeah. Okay, very quickly. quick one. And it's about um, uh, the money and uh, foreign diplom diplomatic policy. And uh, I think, you know, if you look at, at the moment, the West is actually asking the Chinese government uh, to do things and to contribute to save the world, mm. blah, blah, blah. And, um, but, uh, as an individual Chinese, and uh, it's not only my opinion, but a lot of people are actually asking uh, where did the government put money to in the past? And uh, they start to question this. And then with the over foreign pressure, they somehow feel that the foreign um, companies or governments are asking the Chinese governments, re but just ignoring the ordinary Chinese people's will. And um, that is... Uh, that is what uh, something uh, people have discussed on the internet a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, thank you. Right, um, at the back there. Blue arm, is it blue or black? I can't see. Um, I'll just stand up. Um, I just want to do a um, question, uh, a, a point that you raised about people being risk averse or they're concerned about risk because this kind of doesn't sit comfortably with me in terms of the way I would understand what's happening in China, because we had an earlier discussion today at a previous session on innovation in Asia. And one of the points that emerged from that is that what is distinctive about China, and about the political elite, is that there is a real belief in technology and a belief that you can, through technology, raise living standards, uh, you know, have growth, etc. cetera. Um, but at the same time, there seems to be very contradictory things happening within China with regard to the evolution of the market and entrepreneurship, for example. So you do have amazing things happening, for example, particularly around young people in the internet with QQ Tencent, um, which a lot of people in the West know nothing about. Very briefly, largest social network instant messaging uh, company in the world, 330 million active accounts. It's bigger than the United States population, uh, generating huge amounts of revenue highly profitable, developing things like virtual currencies, which the, in fact the Chinese state is closing down because it's threatening the stability of the yuan. Um, my question is, in those, in those circumstances, um, is there within China a culture of failure, i.e. where you can get venture-backed uh, investment, uh, innovation in new companies or whatever? Is this seen as something that's good or not? Because it seems to me that the enormous growth that's happening, that there is a real dynamic of innovation beginning to occur in China, which seems to not sit comfortably with this notion that people are actually holding on to what they've got. Or is, there, is this another expression of the division between the Chinese 
masses or those within the urban areas and the political elite. Okay. Sorry, you can, you can come in later. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a question on the, on the same lines, actually. We've spoken in previous sessions about uh, research and development, and we, we've heard that there's been a massive increase in the research and development budget in, in China, uh, and also that it's being much more strategically organised and planned. And I wondered if the panel can give more flesh to the substance of what is China thinking about research and development. Thank you. Do you want to pass it forward? <laughs> okay. I don't want to, as a teenager myself, I realized that me and everybody else my age will grow up to have to deal with the problem that the British government and every other government has, dealt, has left for us. Do you think that um, the young people in China, you know, considering that they're in this like, confused state, will be able to rise to the challenge of what they're going to have to deal with and decisions that they're going to have to make? Thank you. Just, could you just pass it? I'm keeping the microphone. We have to run around so much. Hi there. My question is on Western debt. Year on year, America is running multi-billion dollar budget deficits bankrolled largely by bonds sold to China. All the economic theory would suggest that this is not a sustainable relationship. It has to end someday. China is going to say enough is enough. You know, when will that day, what, when will that day happen and, and what will the consequences be for the West? Thank you. Um, do, do you want to come back now? We finish questions. Okay. Um, well, I, I know there was there was no, one no, no, there no. was one question um, earlier that we didn't answer just briefly, which was about religion. Um, and I, I, you know, I mentioned the point that the government. I was at a conference recently where they were talking a lot about uh, how religion can play a social welfare role because there are so many gaps in the Chinese welfare system. I think the government has come to accept that up to a point it will tolerate you know Catholic groups running computer training centres and Buddhist organisations giving money to poor people or helping people pay for their operations. Um, and I have interviewed Chinese government religious affairs officials who've said that. Uh, we, we like the Christians because they pay their taxes. Um, <laughs> although, as Alan says, not everyone pays tax. Um, can I just quickly follow on to some of these questions then? Um, I think, you know, um, the point about risk being risk averse and also at the same time being entrepreneurial, I mean, it, it, it probably does highlight a sort of divide between, you know, older people in the countryside and, and the young generation coming out of these you know, fancy universities or with their foreign degrees or whatever, uh, growing up in a very modern urban world that's really connected to kind of popular culture around the world. Um, and we haven't really talked about the internet today, but I think it's had a huge impact on China in, in so many ways in the last decade. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think you have to say some of the young generation, as I was hinting before, you know, there is a kind of rebellious streak I think the Chinese government channeled it very well this year so that everybody rebelled against Western values, you know. But I think that there's people wanting to do different things. There's, there's a lot of people, you know, talking about being creative. Um, and there are lots of quite anarchic young people setting up weird little companies. And there are venture capitalists, or there were until a few weeks ago, um, sort of wandering around with suitcases of money. Um, but, uh, you know, as I say, some of the older generation do worry that the young generation are very, you know, they have much better informed, they're much better educated, they know a lot about the outside world, but there is this continuing concern about the one-child generation, um, which some young people think is unfair, but a lot of older people still think, you know, can you trust these young kids? They, they, they've lived in a very pampered world. Um, when they get into the job market, you often hear complaints from employers so um, I think you know, they will be capable of making China a much more creative place. Um, but there are people who fear you know, that they won't knuckle down. I, I, I think that economic circumstances will make more of them knuckle down. Thank you. Just on, because it came over um, last lot and this lot and I didn't answer. And I answer this question about the global environment as more of a, as a historian rather than an economist. And I think we have to bear in mind about the limitation of looking at models. I mean, insofar as the, you can even look at the transfer of hegemonic power in the modern or capitalist era, which only happened once before, from, the from um, <coughs> Britain to the United States, 
Uh, and so we can't say, oh, it's going to happen like that again. And the two elements I'd, I'd three elements I'd introduce into that is that the first element is when it happened between uh, Britain and America, it ha happened through the German question, so that America became the leading power of the world without actually fighting Britain because of the German question, because that was the other competing power, uh, uh, which, uh, which goes into the question of the, the debt and the, the significance, is that between Britain and America, the process of economic power, which crystallized much earlier but than political power, actually took a long time. And there were two major crises in the 20s and 30s, particularly over the gold standard and over the Venezuelan oil crisis, before it was resolved. And, and I would think that Lend-Lease 44, 45 was much more important than Suez in actually demonstrating the, the difference. But this time, leaving aside China's activity and agency in it, I think you have to consider, we haven't done it here, we have to consider that we shouldn't be thinking merely of China, we should be thinking about the, of the BRICS and, and the diversity of economic power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, both uh, uh, the declining power of America and Brazil, Russia, India and China uh, not having the same interests are significant in the global economic sphere. At the level of China, there is no interest either in political foreign policy or in banking policy or in economic policy for China to pull the plug at the moment. Absolutely none whatsoever, not least because the Chinese banking system is still so underdeveloped in any shape or form. Uh, and, you know, there's, that's an internal problem. You know, the regulation of loans and bad debt inside China is just astronomical. And I wouldn't see it in the foreseeable future because of the interconnected nature of, uh, of the world economy. It might happen, and what will happen is that China will not tolerate being lectured about human rights by, by regimes which have got no great record on the question, and even if they've got military power, will not be able to use it. So China will just tell them to get will laugh at them in a very polite Chinese way. <laughs> just a little, little yeah. comment, because I want just one more lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, talking about entrepreneurship, I think it is, to some extent, also related to the fact that people do not trust the government so much. And um, so when, uh, and also, again, it's uh, related to the younger generation issue. So I, I do not think uh, they are really uh, different. And also, um, when people spend money, and whose money are they spending uh, when they try to invest or, or when they try to uh, save, and uh, whose money it is, it's often uh, important to, to trace that as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to make one super fast point about investment. Um, investment in China is, is astonishingly high. Its uh, rates of investment are almost 40% of profits, which is way higher than Japan during its period of growth or Korea, and it's about twice as much as India currently invests. And so one of the, uh, one of the things that actually people, you know, when you start looking at the Chinese economy, and you say, well, you know, given how much investment there is, and you start asking, you know, why is growth so slow? You know, and most people think, you know, growth is incredibly fast, but, you know, why isn't it being more efficiently invested? If you invest twice as much as India, but you're only achieving, you know, one or two percent more in terms of growth, then something's not working very well. And so the, the way in which that kind of plays backwards is that, you know, the banking system is entirely state-owned, which isn't necessarily the best or most efficient way to invest capital. And I think the reform of the banking system would be something which is integral to the development of more innovative and more effective entrepreneurialism within China. Right. Last three questions. Or one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, somebody's hanging on to the microphone. No, no, we need the microphone. Got a phone drop with you now, anyway. Yes, it's, it's, it's in relation to um, uh, looking forward and uh, uh, and the points about democracy and Confucianism. Is there uh, are the conditions there uh, in China for the possibility of a, a third alternative, if like a new new forms uh, of uh, democracy or new forms of uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, living, new forms of society, are the conditions there at all? Or do we have to continue to say to the Chinese, you've got to reform your banking system, you've got to get new laws, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that? Because I, I don't want to, you know, I don't think it's our role over here to, to say that. I just wonder whether there is a uh, uh, there is the condition uh, uh, for, for, for self development, however uneven that may be. Are the conditions there for some new form? Okay, just the last question over there. 
Thank you. Um, just to turn the question on its head and ask, what is China not thinking in terms of whether, whether that's what is China not thinking that it should be thinking about or whether that's what we believe that China considers important, but in effect, no one in China actually gives a damn about it. Thank you. Right, um, I'm going to give the speakers one minute each. Adrian, you want to start? Um, okay, so um, I guess on this question of democracy, it is a big question which comes up over and over, and, you know, like, is there a new system emerging out of China in relation to, uh, you know, how to structure, you know, what state capitalism is and how to relate to your population. I think one of the things which is important in terms of, you know, like whether or not democracy is being brought forward, a lot of people actually in China don't particularly want democracy, and particularly the middle class, who you traditionally look to as being drivers for democracy, are still a minority in China. You know, they're sort of, depending on how you count them, you know, maybe 200 million against, you know, 1.3 billion. And, you know, the idea that the middle class in China would be beholden to the vote of, you know, large swathes of, of you know, what they consider to be appallingly ignorant peasants is completely antithetical. And so, um, I think, you know, I think democracy isn't going to happen in China anytime soon, and I think that they are going to continue with a, a peculiar and unique system, which is definitely forming a new model for places like, you know, lots of countries in Africa and other parts of the developing world which want to move more towards that idea rather than being beholden to the IMF ideology of, of the post-Washington consensus period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, in terms of democracy, I actually think this um, uh, party constantly trying to reinvent itself, if you think it is uh, based on uh, who has louder voice. And, uh, and then as a result, that will lead to um, uh, what the parties want to represent. So uh, in a way, it's, I would consider it's a kind of a, a quasi-democracy. <laughs> and. Um, Simply, uh, there's no negotiation at the top level. And then as a result, how to cater this particular situation, then that is, oh, you can think it's, it's probably a type of uh, creation. Um, okay, I'll do, I'll do it. Um, the question on innovation, I think China is incredibly innovative and there's lots of small companies, I mean like any in economic environment, if you look at Japan in the 50s and 60s, the number of small businesses that went out of business, uh, was a huge turnover, but that's an expression of dynamism rather than the question of anything else and that will happen in China. Report an, uh, an, an anecdote, uh, uh, I, I sent a delegation including an entrepreneur to Chengdu uh, two months ago and tr he was trying to sell a new water valve which he can't sell in Europe and immediately somebody, his res the response of a local business was, oh we can do that. And that's in part, and it won't be long before the innovation, the technological innovation will be based in China as well as just imported. The only problem, of course, it's, and it's the same as here, would be that everybody wants to do the same. It's like in Britain, we have an iconic building to regenerate a city. In China, everybody, every city and region has a science park, and some of them will go belly up, but most of them won't. Um, second thing, I just to make this point about, and, and it's related to that, is just remember that China is a great example of uneven and combined development. So it's got really, really nasty coal mines, but it's also got the highest developed photovoltaic power plant system in the world. So they're just going to go streets ahead while everybody else is worrying about you know, the, the, the environment. And lastly, just on the youth, because it's, of course it is, it's, it's a problem. It's a, there's, a, there's a paradox or there's a tension there between the fact that Chinese youth are incredibly ambitious, they're incredibly talented, and they're incredibly hard working. But at the moment, and maybe it's because I'm an old fart, you just cannot quite see the social environment in which their personal energy can be translated in a wider context, and that seems to be the tension inside China. Thank you. Well, I think we'll be hearing a lot in the next couple of months from the Chinese government about the, the, the 30 years of reform and opening up, and uh, you know, they, they would tell, tell us that uh, they have created a new form of society already, and it, it's called the socialist market economy. Um, I think that it's true that, uh, you know, despite all of, all of the control that exists, China actually is changing, as we heard from, from Bingqin and, and, and others. Um, and there are so, sort of aspects of a kind of more democratic system or more transparent system of government. I mean, the big cities are trying to promise to businesses that they will respond to their requests within so many days. And if they don't, you 
you can sue them on certain issues, you know. So it's at a low level, but it's there. And I think a lot of the change in China, as I talked about earlier, has really been from the grassroots in terms of social change. Um, I mean, that brings us perhaps to the question of, of what China's not thinking. We do have a much more open media than, than in the past. Um, but for me, coming back from China and being here for a while, as I have done in the last few weeks, that you still realize there are some things that are just not talked about in China, and that's partly the government channeling debate and channeling what you, you, know, what you can see on the internet. If you look at a Chinese website, it's got thousands of news stories, but there will be certain key subjects that it won't discuss. One good example, actually, is nuclear power. You know, China has lots of nuclear power stations. It's building lots more. One of them is only about 100 kilometers from Shanghai, but nobody ever talks about it. I mean, Greenpeace China tried last year for the first time in memory, but uh, it's just not a subject. You know, the government says nuclear power is good and, ev and nobody can disagree. So that's just an example of where we're at. Thank you. Can we thank the speakers?